Welcome to today's event, Historic Monetary and Fiscal Stimulus, Savior or Destroyer, hosted by CFA Society Chicago's Education Seminars Advisory Group. Information on upcoming events can be found on the Society's website at www.cfachicago.org. All mics for attendees will automatically be muted during the event. If you have a question for our panel, please use the Q&A feature. This event is being recorded. Today's discussion will be moderated by Mata Loberg, CFA, an analyst on the Dynamic Allocation Strategies team at William Blair. She is responsible for global macro research and has been published in several economic journals. Joining Lada today for today's discussion is Randall Ray, senior scholar at Levy's Economics Institute and professor of economics at Bard College. I would like to thank today's sponsor, Harbor Capital Advisors. I will now turn it over to Lada, our moderator. Hello, welcome. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, we were planning to have a debate between two uh, big personalities. Uh, it turns out that Stephen Moore is busy opening the economy and he cannot join us today. We hope to have him on on a future event. However, we do get a lot of questions in the society and requests about learning more about modern monetary theory. And it so happens that we have one of the most prominent scholars uh, to talk about that. So let me introduce Randall Ray. This will therefore be a discussion between the two of us and I will uh, have him take up most of the space with me asking questions. Um, and feel free to submit questions at any time. We will take questions in the end, um, but you can submit them at any time and we'll answer them afterwards. We'll aim at around 30, 40 minutes of discussion and then go to Q&A in the end. Branda Ray is a senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute and a professor of economics at Bard College. And his research focuses on um, providing very much a critique of the orthodox monetary theory, uh, as well as some policy on full uh, employment policy and fiscal policy generally. He has been a, a big figure in the development of an alternative approach in all these fields very much. He's an author of numerous books most recent book is Why Minsky Matters, an introduction to the work of a maverick economist. And one of his books is Modern um, Money Theory, a primer on macroeconomics for sovereign monetary systems. He um, therefore is, I believe, best known as a scholar of MMT. He has a BA uh, from the University of uh, Pacific and an MA and a PhD from Washington University. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. So I think uh, this discussion will be less policy and more economics and a little bit nerdier than we may have uh, anticipated. But um, maybe you can actually start by giving a little bit of an overview of um, how you from a modern, from I, I'm gonna use just MMT now from <laughs> here on. I hope everybody understand, knows the, the acronym by now. How, from an MMT perspective, uh, you look at the current situation, the economy, as well as a little bit, just kind of an overview, so that we get a, a sense of how what the approach is actually is about. Okay. Um, yes, in the past uh, few weeks, we have written on uh, the MMT view of the crisis and how to go about resolving the problems that we face. Of course, uh, everyone will agree. Uh, that we are in a very strange situation, very unusual situation. Usually uh, severe economic downturns and as well financial crises begin with something happening on the demand side. Uh, this time it is a supply side problem, a huge supply side problem. Um, so uh, th then of course that creates a demand side problem. So if people can't go to work, that is a supply side problem. Uh, and then if they're, um, they don't get paid, you create a demand side problem. And I think that um, some of the policies that have uh, 
uh, been undertaken and make a lot of sense. I think others uh, don't necessarily make too much sense. I think the, the, the first response was trying to tackle the demand side problem. I mean, the idea of mailing out checks to everybody uh, in order to get them to go out and spend to buy stuff that isn't being produced didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the attempts to try to support payrolls, I think, is a step in the right direction. Um, we don't want to lose jobs permanently, and so it makes uh, sense to try to take over the payrolls. Now, I, I have a plan for that. I don't want to sound too much like Elizabeth Warren, uh, that I think will work better than the one that we're, um, the, the course that we're on now. So that's looking at the fiscal side, the monetary policy side. Um, okay, so be, because of the, the crisis and the expectations, and of course, that's going to have a huge impact on the stock market. Uh, and so we turned it into a financial crisis too. And I, I think that uh, what we exposed was a financial system that was in terrible shape uh, before the crisis began. Um, and I can talk more about that. Uh, and uh, I, I would say we knew a financial crisis was coming uh, long before anyone talked about a coronavirus. Um, we were set up for a financial crisis, but this really exposed that, sparked it, and so we see that firms can't even make it through one week, one bad week, and they're already begging for bailouts. Uh, I think that tells us something about the state of the financial uh, system. So anyway, when a crisis hits, we must have a lender of last resort. And so the Fed has entered as a lender of last resort. I think it's doing a better job than it did last time around. And probably that's because lessons were learned. You got to go big. You don't auction off a hundred billion at a time. You stand there and you say, whatever it takes, we are here and we're going to do it. Um, and I, I expect that this one will be bigger than last one in terms of the response that will be required of the Fed. The Fed last time sort of, uh, you know, meted out tiny little amounts over a period of more than two years. By the end, if you total up what the Fed did last time, it was 29 trillion. They originated 29 trillion in loans, uh, spaced out over a, a bit more than a two year period. Um, and so people are saying this is all un unprecedented in terms of the volume, but eventually the Fed got there. And this time we're gonna get there much quicker. So that's a good thing and expanding the safety net to municipal bonds and so on is a good thing. Uh, there are uh, other aspects that look more like QE. In my 29 trillion, I was not including QE, which came later. Uh, QE just doesn't work. And I, I, I don't believe the Fed should be doing that. Lender of last resort, yes. Quantitative easing, no. I'll, I'll stop because I know I went on a long time. I mean, so I, I think I think uh, at this stage people may be surprised because uh, if they think MMT, you sound almost like conservative here. Um, what about what might they be getting wrong about, you know, expectations about you know the approaches here from the MMT perspective? You mentioned, for example, the checks not doing anything. People have been especially that taking that as helicopter money is here. The MMT people have won. Why is that wrong? Uh, we never advocated helicopter money. We advocate targeted spending. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me back up then just a little bit. So our policy has never been helicopter money. Our policy has never been having the central bank print up money to pay for government spending. That is not MMT. We don't recommend any change in the way that uh, the Fed and the Treasury currently coordinate their spending. Uh, we already have in place all the procedures we need to spend as much as uh, uh, whatever is budgeted by Congress and signed by the President. And if we boost that and continue to boost it with more stimulus packages, we don't need to change any procedures whatsoever. There's never going to be helicopters flying around. Uh, we're never going to be running a printing press. All treasury spending always takes one form, 
which is that the Fed credits a private bank's balance sheet, the reserves holdings go up, and that bank credits the account of the recipient. And that is exactly what we're doing. There's no helicopters. So people are getting checks in the mail or they're getting credits to their bank accounts and their banks are getting credits of reserves. That's how modern governments spend. They all spend this way. Nobody prints money to spend and we don't recommend that they do. Uh, now, the, the one thing that um, is a little bit unusual, so in the UK, they have told the, uh, the Bank of England that uh, it can essentially offer overdrafts to the treasury. No big deal. We could do that too. It doesn't really change much of anything because there's no problem selling bonds. So in the United States on, with our current procedures, the treasury will first sell some bonds. The central bank makes sure banks have the reserves to buy those bonds. And then if the banks don't want the bonds, if they don't want to hold on to them, the central bank buys them in open market operations and they end up at the Fed anyway. Okay, so the Bank of England is going to skip those steps and just take the treasury's debt directly. Fine. It's not a big deal. We did that too in both world, war, world, world wars. And uh, over the past hundred years, the Fed has done that at, at, on other occasions to a limited extent anyway. So there's nothing new about that. It's no big deal. It's not printing money. Okay, uh, and we have been joined by Steve Moore now, and uh, before we go over to him then, uh, it's really good actually that the audience had gotten the MMT kind of the baseline here, like where you're coming from. Is there anything like just short that you would want to fill in just from that perspective? Okay, well, so once you understand how modern governments spend, uh, it's basically keystrokes. Keystroke credits to bank reserves and those banks keystroke credit to demand deposit accounts of the recipients. You can't run out of keystrokes as long as you have one person at the Fed and one person at the Treasury that can, you know, hit a keystroke on the computer, you can't run out. And, you know, this should not be controversial at all. I don't know why it is. It's not controversial. You cannot run out of keystrokes no more than the scorekeeper at a baseball game is going to run out of uh, runs to award to the Boston uh, Red Sox. Can't run out. Whatever it is, they can keystroke it. Can you spend too much? Okay, you can't run out, but can you spend too much? And the answer to that is, of course you can. Okay, you're going to get inflation if you spend too much. You can even get inflation before you get to full employment, depending on how you spend it. And that's why we want targeted spending. We don't want uh, a check showing up in everybody's mailbox. Okay, that's not the right way to go about it. You want to target the spending. What we need is recovery of our society and our economy. So we need to target health right now. We're going to have to try to save jobs. Uh, and so I said, uh, taking over some of the payrolls is probably a good idea. And there may be better ways to do that. Um, and we're going to have to do something about uh, small businesses that won't survive uh, you know, two months uh, with no sales. They're not going to make it. So we need to do something. Thank you so much. Okay, so we do have two panelists now. So let me introduce. I haven't I haven't made the introduction for you since we didn't see your face. So now that we see your face, Stephen, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. <laughs> so uh, even more, um, he is a visiting uh, senior fellow in, in economics at the Heritage Foundation, and um, he did serve at, as a senior economic advisor to Trump's president campaign, where he worked on energy and budget issues and. Right now, you are on the Trump's task force to open the economy. Is that correct? I am. Very good. Um, I can mention, too, that uh, Stephen Moore is a news contributor. He's been uh, an analyst with CNN. He has been the senior economics writer for the Wall Street Journal editorial page and a, a member of the journal's editorial board. And he still writes for uh, the Wall Street Journal, as you, many of you will, will have seen. Uh, he has served as uh, the founder and president of the Club for Growth, and he is an author of six books. His latest book is Trumponomics, the inside story of the Trump economic boom. Um, he, has, uh, he graduated from the University of Illinois, so welcome to Chicago, and he has an MA in economics from George Mason University, which is also where I got 
most of my economic schooling. So uh, great to have you here. Um, we did get a little bit of an introduction on, from the MMT kind of perspective of where do we see the economy right now um, and policy and things like that. I'm not going to ask you to do the big picture here, but uh, maybe you can just tell us kind of what you're doing right now, what keeps you mostly busy and what you are uh, spending most of your time on you because what you see as the most pressing issues right now. Great. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry to be uh, a few minutes late. I, I am on that presidential uh, uh, task force and we just got done with our meeting. So I was, I was uh, um, uh, a few minutes late, but I, I appreciate your uh, bearing with me. And so I'll just give you a quick summary of where I think things are on the economy. Obviously, this is a cataclysmic event uh, that uh, it's amazing because I did help with uh, Donald Trump in terms of the policies that we put in fort place in 2017 and 18. And we're mighty proud of what happened. It was it created the biggest boom we've had in this country in, in probably decades. You know, it's amazing to think back in February, we had 7 million surplus jobs, something that's never happened before in this country. We had, we finally reached, uh, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, uh, well over 3% growth. We were just, we'd finished the trade deals with Canada, Mexico, and China, which was a big, big uh, boost to the economy. It just couldn't have gone better. 50 year low in unemployment, wages rising, the most beautiful picture you ever saw. And I remember pinching myself thinking, look, there's, there's something's gonna happen. A meteor is gonna hit our planet or there's gonna be a terrorist attack or We're something. <laughs> it just seemed too good. And then, and then we've got this horrible virus. And I have two good friends who uh, both nearly died from the virus. So uh, I, I don't wanna be seen as someone who uh, understates the lethality of this uh, virus. But I do think that um, history will judge what we've done over the last, uh, you know, two, month or two to be uh, a catastrophic mistake. Uh, although we know a lot more about the virus we, today than we did six, eight weeks ago. Um, so we, but we are where we are. So what do we do going forward? Well, number one, we've got to get society back up and running. We, we should have done it last week, but we've got to get this uh, it doesn't matter how much money we print. It doesn't matter how many trillion dollar bills we spend. Uh, if people aren't producing, you don't have an economy. If businesses are going bankrupt, they can't come back. They're not like Lazarus. They can't be resurrected. And every day by the tens of thousands, businesses are failing. It's, it's heartbreaking, actually, because um, a lot of these folks call me up and, and they say, look, if I don't get revenues in the door by, for four or five days, I'm, I'm out of business. And that's it's just so tragic because people put their whole life and livelihoods and their life savings into building these businesses. And then to see within a matter of three weeks them to be vaporized is, is really uh, terrible. And, you know, that we, we will probably see, I think tomorrow we get the latest numbers on the unemployment. I think we'll be closing in on 30 million. 30 million people have been put in the unemployment lines. Uh, one of the points I've made, because I've been a pretty outspoken person for getting things up and running again as quickly as possible. And, you know, the left, I think, has created this false narrative that uh, if you want to open up the economy, you want to kill people. Um, and uh, look, I mean, this is, it's very simple. Uh, if we don't get things up and running, the, the human misery that we'll be creating for our society, in my opinion, will be multiple times greater than the threat of this virus. So we have to get up and running. We've got to do it in a smart way. We need to, um, you know, isolate the people who are at risk. This is an old person's disease, right? Uh, we know that now that 70, 75% of the people are dying from this are people of the age of 70 to 75. So we want to keep those people safe and, and uh, sequestered and and uh, isolated so they don't get the d disease. We also know, for example, chronic diseases and so on. So we know 80 to 90% of the people who are gonna, who are really susceptible to the disease, those are the people we need to keep safe. And then we also know that this is, uh, is with any, any pandemic, these are urban diseases. So or the 12 or 13, if you look at a map, you can see that there are 12 or 13 uh, metropolitan areas in the United States that have been account for about 90% of the uh, deaths and cases. So you wanna, probably keep them shut down longer. But, you know, there's over half of the counties in the United States that have either zero or very few uh, deaths and, and contamination. So we got to be smart about opening things up, obviously using social distancing and that kind of thing. And that's what the president wants to do. Uh, now, where we are in terms of uh, once we get things open, what do we do to provide a stark, uh, kind of spark for the economy? I happen to think that uh, the bill that we passed a few weeks ago was, I would say, on balance, um, 
you know, I was in favor of a loan program for businesses so that they could get through this period because we had healthy businesses two months ago. You want to give them loans to get through it. And then that loans that I want LOA on us, we made a big mistake in converting these from loans to grants, but you want to prov provide uh, a kind of ramp so they can get through this. Uh, but I think that the, uh, you know, the four months of unemployment benefits can be hard to get people back to work. Uh, economics is all about incentives and we, we've incentivized people to stay uh, out of work. I just as one, you know, little anecdote, I have a friend who runs a construction company has 200 employees and the day after they passed that bill uh, in Congress, uh, uh, almost 100 of them walked off the job because they could make as much money not working as working. And so I'm not so sure this was such a great thing with, that we did with that $2 trillion. What I favor going forward, I certainly, I think the most disastrous thing and something I will fight with every bone in my body is a, is a blue state um, a bailout. And I know most of you there are in Chicago, but uh, there's no pot at the end of this rainbow. Uh, and we're, we're going to fight like crazy to make sure that these areas don't get a bucket of money from, the, from Washington. It's not fair to the states that have been fiscally responsible to have to bail out New York and California and Illinois and New Jersey and Connecticut. And I don't think it's going to happen. I think we'll be able to block that, although they'll get some money for some of the health expenditures. But what I do favor, and I think the thing that would be best for the economy right now, and I think we've got a lot of momentum for this, is to suspend, suspend the payroll tax for the rest of the year. So every Business in America, we get a 7.5% reduction in their payroll costs, and every worker in America, including minimum wage workers, would get a 7.5% raise in their salary right in their paycheck. They get it right away. No transaction costs. It's a beautiful thing. It's just you're, they're not, the government's not taking this money away from you anymore. So that would be good for employment, good for hiring. Um, and uh, that's kind of it. I can, one thing on the monetary policy, and then I'll open up for discussion. Look, my, my, I think we are in a severe um, deflation right now. We're in a deflation. I like to, many of you know that I was uh, nominated to be on the Fed by uh, President Trump about a year ago. And uh, so uh, I, I know a little bit about monetary policy. I, I wasn't actually too disappointed in not being on the Fed, but I, but I think times like now, I kind of wish I were. But I, I, I've been critical of the Fed up until, I think they've, for the most part, the Fed has been doing the right thing. What's going on right now is you've had a mass, whenever you have an, an international crisis like this, whether it's a terrorist attack, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a, a war, whether it's a, a, a virus like this, there is always a rush to buy dollars. Dollars are a rush to safety. And what we are seeing right now is the most massive uh, rush to hoard dollars, maybe in American history. And when that happens and the Fed doesn't accommodate that, you get a severe deflation. And for those of you students of history, you know that the, what happened in the Great Depression was it was caused by many things, trade policies and uh, the New Deal made obviously things worse. But the, uh, but the big factor was the deflation and the monetary a base, which which uh, shrinks the economy in a rapid way. If you look at what ha I like to look at commodity prices, obviously, you all know what's happened with oil in the last few days, but commodities across the board are crashing in price. We need to have more liquidity, more. I mean, a lot of my friends say, well, they've already done it. They have to do more and more and more and more of this so that we don't see a catastrophic reduction in prices. And, um, you know, they, they're going to have to be, continue to buy bonds, assets, whatever it takes to get more dollar liquidity into the economy. Uh, but at, in the end of the day, I'll stop with this. The, the loans, the bailouts, all of these things we're spending money on, they don't make any difference if you don't have people producing goods and services and you don't have production. So it starts, a, a recovery can only begin when we have our businesses and, and, uh, and workers back on the job. Yeah, there's a lot of things that I want to follow up on, but let me just start with one thing you mentioned, which is inflation, deflation is what you're saying we're having now. Yep. And I know that because a lot of our members who are listening now, uh, there will be an equities, there will be a fixed income, everybody wants to know exactly that. And I'll start uh, then with, with uh, and, and I'll turn it over to, to Randall and ask, you talked about a supply shock we're kind of leading into a demand shock so if we know our like supply and demand curves here we know that we shift the supply curve up uh, we get higher prices so that will be inflation uh what's your view on inflation versus deflation in this situation well there's a lot i think we get either one um i think that uh if um 
this one this one round of checks is the end of the story, then I, I agree with Steve. Uh, we could be looking at deflation. Uh, if we um, kept uh, sending more and more checks and could keep aggregate demand up, um, of course, you, there's a lot of things you cannot buy. Um, and those are relatively large parts of the consumer basket. So they have a relative weight in the basket. Um, but some of the things you can buy are rising fast in price. And those will become uh, a relatively larger part of the basket. So medical supplies and so on. Um, and if we, so if those are going up and we also add uh, more stimulus checks to the economy, I don't think inflation is completely out of the question, uh, but we would have that in conjunction with very high unemployment and businesses closing and all that. So it would be more of a stagflation sort of a problem, not a problem of uh, excessive demand. Um, it's hard to know which one of those uh, is going to win out. I, I don't think it's something we should, that we should be worrying about. Okay, I, I agree with Steve. We should not be worrying about inflation if this is where it's coming from. Uh, we should be tackling the, the, the problems in the economy, which are businesses closing down, people losing their jobs, people s will start to lose their houses, they're going to be evicted. I mean, we can try to control that, but you're not going to be able to keep everyone in, uh, in their uh, places. Uh, and that is a much bigger problem than whether the CPI goes up or goes down. Would you agree that there's no policy really that can help out much? It's really all about trying to open the economy as, as fast as possible. I mean, a lot of these policies have to do with a kind of a bridge that we can be closed for a while if we can make people and businesses survive to the other side, kind of. Um, no, I think that there are other things we can do. Um, so uh, moving the payroll onto the federal government's budget is something we can do. Now, I, uh, so Denmark is doing this and uh, we're doing it a little bit of it. Uh, I would do it a different way. This is the time to implement a universal job guarantee at a decent wage with a decent benefit package. We hire the workers temporarily. We start paying them immediately. We find things that they can do to help the economy and our uh, uh, health uh, recover. And uh, as businesses come back online, they can hire them back. Uh, they will be a pool of employable labor uh, going to work every day, uh, showing that they are available to work, uh, retaining their skills to the, the best of our ability to get things that give them uh, tasks that um, will keep their skills uh, in use and let the firms hire them back when we get out of this. And, they will hire them at the correct pace because as businesses finally open up and need employees, they will start to hire them out of the job guarantee pool. So that is what I would do for uh, labor. It provides the income and it provides us with a, um, a huge labor force to help us try to recover. Uh, as far as uh, firms go, I, I actually agree with Steve uh, on, um, loans rather than grants. I don't like the idea of grants either. Uh, if, they, if they have a good business model and they can recover, let's let them service a loan, give them good terms, you know, let them pay it back over the next five, 10 years. I, I think that this is uh, perfectly fine. They're supposed to be for-profit firms. So let them uh, pay back part of their profits uh, on the loans that help uh, tie them through. Uh, it should be targeted to the uh, smaller firms. I think one of the the bad things that has apparently been done is that uh, bigger firms that may well not need it or should not need it are the ones that are uh, soaking up mo most of the money. So we need to target it uh, small firms. So that, that's sort of an outline of the approach that I would take. I just finally, I really think we should let people who know something about health determine when the time is to go back to work. And I don't think that this uh, is the right time. From everything that I can uh, gather, uh, I'm, an, I'm a doctor of economics, not a doctor of coronavirus. And I, I think taking advice from economists on this is literally crazy. So Steve, what would you, be your view, uh, uh, the first point that, that 
Brandon made here in terms of um, we have this interim period, um, we can have the government being more involved in creating jobs and those people will have jobs and then go on to the firms as they open up. Well, look, economics is really not very complicated. It's pretty, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, there's two types of people in the economy. There's people who produce and there are people who don't produce. And I like to go, but to make it really simple, excuse me just a second. I like to um, make it very simple. It's, it's you know, you're two, two people on an island. <laughs> if, if one is produced, the only way you can give money to the second one is, is to take it from the first one, right? So all of these programs, like having the government pay people's payroll or, or, or unemployment insurance. It's just taking money from productive people and giving it to non-productive people. Now, on, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, as a compassionate humanitarian policy that, you know, we've decided we're a rich society. We're not as rich as we used to be, but we're a rich society. So we can afford to make sure that people have a safety net. I'm not arguing against it. I'm just saying a safety net doesn't generate growth, right? It reduces growth. And so um, we have to start doing things that incentivize uh, employment and hiring and investment and saving and the kinds of things that are good for a, an economy. And uh, that's why I kept telling the congressmen and the senators, I mean, what in the hell are you doing? You keep, you keep talking about this bill, this $2 trillion bill, it's, it's a stimulus. It doesn't stimulate anything. It doesn't stimulate a anything to take money from people who are producing and giving money to people who are unemployed and, 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 you know, and loans, and, and in some cases, just giving businesses money. Uh, I, I really do, look, I take this point about the, there's a debate right now that's going on inside the White House and in society writ large about the economic and uh, the health trade-offs in the situation. And what has happened is the left, you know, the people in favor of the shutdown try to take the moral high ground. And I've refused to do that. They do not have the moral high ground. The amount of human suffering uh, from what is happening right now, I think a lot of Americans believe, on, and by the way, the polls do show that most Americans do support the shut lockdown. Uh, and they don't want to go back to work until, you know, it's, they feel like it's safe to do. And by the way, they won't go back to work until most of them, but some will. But uh, my point is that I, I know a lot, I've talked to a lot of people, I mean, family members who, who think we have to just wait until every, every uh, last death is, is, uh, is suffered from this disease. And then people th really think that three or four weeks from now, they go out and everything's back to normal. Uh, like being in a coma and you come out of a coma. No. I want people to be very clear about that. It's not going to be normal. It's going to be a freaking disaster. I mean, we're not going to see the, when a business is dead, it's dead. We're going to see 20% un unemployment for months and months and months. We're going to plunge tens of millions into poverty. We're going to see increase in, in, uh, in suicide rates. We're going to see increases in alcohol. We already are seeing this. I mean, the toll that this is taking, we're reversing 10 years of economic progress in, in three months by doing this. And every day that goes by, it's not a linear relationship. It's like the virus curve. It, it goes up and up and up and up. And so uh, we've been doing some calculations. If you can get the economy open by May 1st, we can maybe start to see some plateauing of this economic carnage by maybe, maybe the end of the summer and hopefully the fall, we could start to see some of that V-shaped recovery. But I'm telling you this, if you keep this economy shut down past June 1, you're talking about a Great Depression. You're talking about perhaps two or three years of extreme deprivation. And the reason I refuse to let people on the other side take the moral high ground here is the people who are being destroyed, whose lives are being crushed, are the least among us. The people that Nancy Pelosi says she cares about. Those are the people whose lives have been destroyed here. They're the people who are working maybe $15, $20 an hour jobs, and now they have nothing. They've lost their paychecks. And there's, those are the ones, you've all seen the pictures of the people in the, uh, in the, at the, at the food, uh, the Salvation Army food trucks. They're a mile long and they're getting longer and longer and longer every, every week. And, you know, when I grew up, I was uh, uh, the son of uh, depression era parents. They talked all the time about the Great Depression. And I always thought, thank God, we're never gonna see that in our lifetime. But if we make big policy mistakes right now, and look, I hope I'm wrong. I, that would, nothing would make me happier than everything's great by July and we're back to normal. But I'm, I'm very doubtful of that. And, uh, and I, I worry too that, you know, if we go into the, it, 
we go into November and, and you elect someone like Joe Biden, and then you have massive tax increases on the rich and wealth taxes and so on, it just, it just even you know, makes the crisis uh, worse. So we have to be really smart about this. And I actually do think in the long run, the, the threat to human health and, and well-being is, is, uh, is much, 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 much worse. I mean, I'd say orders of magnitude worse if we don't get the society open quickly. When you're when, saying, once we, we open, open, we might, might not, not, not might, might, no, no, slow down slow the heart, so to speak. Um, that, that, that certainly doesn't, doesn't sound, sound like the V-shaped like recovery, 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 recovery that people, people are, are talking, talking about. about. And and yeah, it's probably it's, you. You know, you is probably the best we could, you know, like a flat, flattening, and then hopefully, you know, then after maybe three or four months of a, of a real, summer is going to be a disaster. Summer is going to be brutal, brutally tough on Americans. Um, and then, as I said, hopefully, you know, we can get something, something going. Um, you know, I'll just give you one, uh, airlines. I talked to the airlines. Right? They can't even get flights up and running until at the very earliest, you know, June. Uh, I mean, not June, I mean, September. So it's not like, oh, boom, everything's up and, you know, it's just going to take so long to get everything Going again, of course, people have suffered massive reductions in wealth and massive reductions in income. They don't have the money to go out to the restaurants. They don't have the money to, to do the things that they normally did. I mean, we're talking about a 20% uh, potential, 20 to 25% reduction in every, every American's living standard. That's pretty severe. Randy, would you, uh, would you would expect, you expect a, V-shape, a V-shape? V-shape? The, the, the kind of description that Steve has, does that sound right to you? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's going to look more like an L. Uh, look, it, when, when people speak, I don't know if it's mine either, a big echo. I hope it's not everyone. I do hear the echo, yeah. I, I can hear echo myself, though, as well. I don't know. <laughs> I know. We can all try to mute when we're, when not, we're not talking, I guess. I think, I think that it's just started. So I'm not sure where that came from. Oh, it's okay now. All right. Uh, no, I think it's going to be uh, an L. And as we um, uh, start to recover, that the bottom part will start to slope up a bit. Uh, I would say uh, we're, we're looking at a decade. Um, to get to get back. I mean, assuming that we're going to go about this the conventional way uh, that Steve has laid out, uh, with a, um, a a job guarantee, as I was talking about. I, I mean, we immediately resolve all the problems he's talking about. We start giving people a job, give them a job that begins on Monday, and we start paying that. Now we may not have tasks for them. Uh, just because of the the health dangers, so we will gradually find tasks for them. Uh, we can pay them first. He, Steve imagines the economy as being zero sum. It is not zero sum. We do not live in a zero sum economy. This is capitalism. Uh, we have free lunches. They're all over the place. If you employ somebody who is unemployed and they produce something useful, that is a free lunch. We have massive amounts of unused resources right now today. Putting those to, to use is a free lunch. There always are free lunches in our economy. There always have been, uh, even right before the coronavirus when we supposedly were at full employment, there were about 10 million people who would have accepted a job if one was available. Uh, only a fraction of those are counted as officially unemployed, but people who are out of the labor force uh, have characteristics that, that uh, you cannot distinguish between them and someone who's officially unemployed. Um, they, they want jobs, they're available to work. Uh, they just may have not looked in the past two weeks or even the past a year. Um, so we always have free lunches out there. And the problem is that all of this fear about government spending and government involvement in the economy is what makes us go hungry. If we uh, took advantage of the free lunch, we actually could have more output. So anyway, no, I think the recovery will be very long. I think trying to get people back to work is going to cause another spike of the, um, the viral outbreak, and we're going to have to retrench again. Uh, but in any case, the recovery will be very long, and um, I'm not sure we're going to return to normal. 
I don't, I don't think that, that actually is a possibility. I think we should aim for something better than what we had. As I said, I, I know Steve and the president think that we were in the greatest economy ever. That I think that uh, that has been exposed as being false. We were not. Uh, we were on the verge of a collapse anyway. And uh, we would have had another global financial crisis and we're going to have a global financial crisis. Uh, it, this just happened to be the trigger. It would be good. Um, I'll have one more question before I turn out the Q and A. Then, um, for both of you, then uh, regarding what you said, policies going forward, what should we expect? Um, we're having an election coming up. Um, both before the election, it feels, you know, like the, the packages that we're seeing, both in the fiscal and, and monetary side, has been enormous. Now, you run a laid out the case earlier why it's actually, in historical perspective, really not, but they seem big. Are we like in the middle of some there, something there, like for the specific crisis, or is it just the beginning in terms of what you both guys would expect? And as well as going forward, then with new administration, what kind of policies should we expect then? That in what way might that change, and on what under what kind of administration? I, should, I guess. Uh, who wants to start? I'll, I'll go first. Um, so, look, I, I don't believe in the zero sum. Uh, you know, the, the whole point of free market capitalism is it's a positive sum game. And, and you know, that's how you increase uh, living standards over time. And it's pretty clear, you know, from just l looking at the evidence from history that, you know, uh, economic growth and prosperity are highly associated with uh, free markets and free enterprise. And so, you know, growth of government, I view as a negative for the economy, not a positive because the government, look, the government doesn't produce anything, right? All the government does is take money from other people who produce things and spend it mo in most cases less wisely than people could spend for it themselves. Now, not in every case, but in, in most cases. And so um, I do agree though. I think one of the things that we both, both may agree on, and I apologize, I missed the beginning of, uh, of this uh, session. But we do have uh, this luxury. I mean, people are buying 30-year bonds, treasury bills for 1.2% 1, 1 interest rates. I mean, first of all, that's insane. I have no idea why anybody would buy a 30-year treasury bill at 1.2% interest rate. I mean, is there anybody out there? I mean, raise your hand if you think the inflation rate over the next 30 years is gonna be less than 1.2%. But the fact is they're buying them. And so uh, that does give us an incentive to borrow. I, I'm not against borrowing. I'm not against borrowing. I'm, I'm for borrowing to do productive things. And so, you know, people are going to lend us money at 1.2% interest rates. Let's just eliminate the income tax, for goodness sakes. I mean, can you imagine how fast this economy would grow if we had no capital gains tax, no dividend tax, no, no tax on working? Uh, so you know, we can, we have kind of an opportunity to do that. And the one sort of thing I agree with monetary, uh, monetary uh, theory, modern monetary theory, is that, you know, you keep doing this until the inflation or interest rates start to rise and they're not rising, they're falling. I mean, we have, we have deflation right now. So we have an, so I don't think the two of us are really arguing about the opportunity we have it's whether it, what matters a lot is whether you use things for productive purposes. I mean, if we did, the, just imagine a minute, we took the tr a trillion dollars and said, we're gonna borrow a trillion dollars, we're gonna eliminate the income tax. I mean, the economy would go through the roof. But on the other hand, what happens if we were to borrow a trillion dollars and, and build more mass transit systems? By the way, mass transit is what was the commuter of this disease, right? We know that pretty, that, the, that we should have shut down mass transit uh, many months before the disease hit. Or green energy projects and things like that, that in my opinion are mostly just a waste of money. Uh, so, it matters how you spend the money and what you use it for. But I think there is, I'm not worried right now about the level of borrowing uh, because there's no sign, there's no shortage of people who wanna buy our bonds. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. The people, are, there's a massive, massive demand for, for United States treasury bills. The 90 day was uh, recently negative. I mean, that, that provides a great arbitrage opportunity for the government. They can actually make money on, on, uh, on borrowing. So uh, let's be smart about what we borrow for. Let's not do a new deal again. That didn't work out so well. Let's not do what Obama did. That didn't work out so well with the Shepard Ruddy projects. We did get the L-shaped recovery. Let's do what Reagan did. Right? I mean, we had the greatest recovery ever under Reagan with six, seven, 8% rates of growth. 
uh, when we cut taxes, cut regulation, and and that's what I would that's what I'm advising Donald Trump to do, and we'll see if he does it. I, I, your mic is off. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just saying, uh, if you want to comment on Steve's comments or or yes. uh, the question that I that I was sure. kind of putting uh, out there. <laughs> I will one up Steve. Let's eliminate the payroll tax. There you go. I'm for, okay. Yeah. And, and let's eliminate the corporate tax. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I won't go into why, but uh, these are perfectly consistent with MMT. So, uh, hold on, let me. Can I just I'll interrupt you? Because I want to. So, at what point? It because I'm trying to understand the sort of philosophy here. At what point? Do you stop borrowing? Well, fortunately, sovereign governments don't borrow. It's their own currency. You and I borrow, corporations borrow. Sovereign governments don't borrow their own currency, no more than you would borrow your own. I owe you a cup of sugar from your neighbor. So I don't see this as borrowing at all. Yes, we can sell government bonds, and if the markets want them, sell them. We don't need to borrow any money from them, but we can sell them bonds. They, they seem to like them. That's fine. Okay. The government only. Yeah, we do have to pay them back, right? I mean, there's a. There's we never pay them back. No, 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 no. We have paid, the United States paid back its government debt one time. That was 1837. It was followed by our first depression. And we've never paid it back ever since. Uh -huh. What has happened is that uh, when debt re, uh, uh, matures, we roll it over into more debt. The uh, debt ratio sometimes goes down, and that's because we have economic growth. I completely disagree about the New Deal. The, the New Deal is what made the United States a developed country. We were a poor developing nation until the New Deal. The New, New Deal built our infrastructure. Uh, I, I imagine that you use LaGuardia. Thank you, New Deal. That was built by the New Deal workers. And on and on and on and on. Tens of thousands of schools or highway systems. And it, 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 this is just, I think, nonsense. The New Deal made America. And we have been underfunding infrastructure since the 1960s, including during uh, the Reagan years. So we do need a new deal. It needs to be a green new deal this time around. And we define that very broadly to include the kinds of things that Steve was talking about, mass transit and so on. Uh, are we in the middle or the beginning? I think we're in the beginning. Um, I think we're gonna see uh, uh, many more packages passed uh, and um, the, the Fed has barely begun, as I said before. Uh, we are going to reach many, many trillions of dollars of um, Fed lending, at least, and uh, also Fed purchases of uh, troubled assets. So we're a long way from the middle, I, I think. Um, uh, the administration, uh, I think Trump is very much stronger than uh, the wishful thinkers think. Uh, I also think that Biden is probably weaker than his critics understand. Um, and uh, so uh, you can guess what my <laughs> prediction is for the presidential election. I think the Democrats, however, this I know this was in your previous question. I think the Democrats are going to do pretty well, uh, fortunately. Um, the, I don't think the DNC has, has provided good leadership, but fortunately we have at the local and state levels, uh, we have um, some pretty good Democrats. So uh, the, the Congress uh, could look um, more democratic than it does now. Uh, whatever administration we have, whatever Congress we have, they're going to be dealing with this problem for many years. So um, I expect many more packages. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll turn to a couple of questions that have come in from the audience because I know that we are limited on time. Um, about reopening the economy, I, I think I'll just direct this to, to, to Steve. Um, how large of an influence does the government have on reopening the economy when consumers and workers will continue to socially distance themselves? It's a bit long, so bear with me. Isn't it on the consumer to decide to do, open, the, uh, open their wallets and reopen the economy? When the government opens the economy, does that really mean the government will just stop providing benefits for business 
that remain closed by choice? That's a great question. And, and but remember, this is kind of a fallacy that people learn in economics is wrong. The, 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 the economy starts with production. You can't consume anything if, if no one produces something. So what really matters is the production of the economy, the supply side. That's why we call it supply side economics. You have to have a supply of goods and services before people can demand them. And so, uh, th but this is a good point. I mean, let's say that tomorrow every governor in America said, okay, you can go out and work. Everything's you know safe, but people didn't believe it was safe. Uh, then you know, people aren't going to come out. I mean, the polls are pretty clear about that. So it has, you have to win back the trust of, of people. I suspect what is going to happen uh, over the next six, eight, 10 weeks is you're going to have a civil war between the red states and the blue states. So the red states will open up. That's Texas and Tennessee and Utah and Idaho and, uh, and um, Georgia and Florida. And the blue states like uh, my home state of Illinois and New York and uh, California and Connecticut and New Jersey and Vermont, they're going to stay shut down. And you'll see if they, if they stay shut down, you know, much longer than a month from now, the, the businesses are going to move out of the blue states and move to the red states where they can actually operate. And in fact, I've talked to a couple of manufacturers in the last few days said, you know, I'm in Wisconsin or I'm in Michigan. If we're not open in two weeks, either I go out of business or I move to Florida. So uh, that'll, that'll put pressure, I think, on some of these states to open up. But the, the premise of this is right. I mean, you, you can't force somebody to go back to work, right? And you can't force uh, a business to open up if they're not ready to and they don't want to, uh, you will see social, the way we, uh, <clears throat> we interact with each other, <coughs> excuse me, the way we interact with each other over the next three, six months, and maybe even a year is gonna be very different from the world we lived in before. So people will, so, you know, you're not gonna be sitting next to a, a, a table of people at the restaurant. There'll be, there'll be tables far apart from each other and, and sporting events aren't gonna open up at least until 2021. Although you might say, see, for example, a golf event with no, you know, people playing golf and a television crew watching them, but there's not going to be spectators. And certainly people aren't going into sports stadiums for a long time. So th there are going to be long um, and lasting implications for this. Uh, and I do think what starts to happen is the people who, uh, who go, come out and start working and start, um, getting back to normal, you, you, it'll, it'll be on a rolling basis and it could take months. Thank you. I don't know if you wanted to add anything there, Randy. I might revise my prediction if the Trump supporters, um, I mean, I'm not uh, hoping for this, of course, but I think opening up the red states will be a big mistake. Oh, I'm sorry, the, I didn't hear the red states, what? Opening up the red states will be a big mistake. Yeah, so it's interesting, like even if, let's say, even even in the absence of people moving from distant states that you took an example, what would drive the growth of the, of the red states here as they open up, the, um, uh, the logic that you proposed previously would suggest that this could really make or break between a V-shaped recovery or a really, really long kind of recovery where you'd see the more of the V-shaped and the, and the red states would actually open up. Um, would you, uh, Randy, say that because it's a mistake, it's actually going to set them back and it's kind of should be the opposite economic effect in the long run between the states opening up early versus late, kind of too early in your view? Yeah, I think we're going to see what happened in New York City happening uh, in the middle of the country. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll jump to another question. This is uh, an MMT question explicitly. Based on modern monetary theory, uh, should our government have any hesitation to conduct healthcare infrastructure as well as physical infrastructure, road, bridges, and so on? The constraint on our government is the resource availability. Now, if we were not in this crisis uh, where we were operating uh, closer to capacity, now, a footnote in that greatest economy ever, our uh, uh, factories were operating below 80% of capacity and we had 10 million people who needed jobs. Okay, so there were, there was spare capacity even then. Um, uh, but if the Green New Deal was phased in, that includes the infrastructure, uh, 
redo the electrical grid, all that stuff, uh, that will demand resources. And it is possible that that would have exceeded the uh, amount of uh, idle resources that we can move to the Green New Deal effort. In that case, we would have had to release more resources uh, from private use to be used in the Green New Deal, which of course is a combination of uh, uh, public and private because the federal government is not gonna build the electrical grid. They're going to uh, provide the funding for it. So we're gonna have to move, we would ha have had to move resources from private sector use to that use and that would require taxes or some other method of freeing up resources. Um, right now, our, our problem is that uh, we have plenty of idle resources. Uh, we could start putting those to use. Now, again, we have to be very careful <laughs> uh, with the social distancing. So there are only some kinds of jobs that can be done right now. Uh, but we could start preparing right now without requiring any tax increase. We could start spending on the Green New Deal using resources that are right now unemployed, um, including businesses and uh, workers. So yes, we can start spending on those things. Thank you. Um, a question uh, about a uh, jobs guarantee issue that you were discussing previously, a, a person in the audience that is a bit confused about this. Uh, they seem to be aligned, it writes like this, it seemed to be aligned on protecting jobs and providing loans to smaller businesses versus grants. Why doesn't Stephen think a job guarantee would work? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by a, a job. If you mean, mean sort of make work government programs, I mean, when has that ever worked? I mean, look at the New Deal when we tried, you know, I, I think the New Deal, it's pretty well established. It was pretty big disaster. I mean, after eight years that Franklin Roosevelt instituted the New Deal, we still had a uh, double digit unemployment rate and it, it, there was no end in sight until World War II happened. I mean, those are just the facts. So it was not, uh, it was not a success. And even Roosevelt's own economist, uh, Morgenthau, ad admitted, and Roosevelt did, that it, none of uh, the spending had worked because you could, the government can only spend if it takes money from some other. In that sense, Milton Friedman obviously was right. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And, and so if you give a lunch to somebody, somebody has to produce it. So uh, we have to work, rely on the private sector. I mean, by the way, why in the world would we agree to a Green New Deal? Has anybody looked at the price of oil lately. I mean, my God, that would be the dumbest thing I could imagine. Oil is practically free now. And we were, it's a the world is awash in oil. Natural gas, which is the major form of ener energy, which is a clean burning fuel. It's, it's the wonder fuel. It's, it's efficient. It's cheap. It's made in America. It's abundant and it's clean burning. I mean, why would we not use natural gas whose costs are one tenth of what it costs to produce electricity with solar power and wind power. I mean, the only reason, ladies and gentlemen, we even use wind and solar power in 80% of the places it's used is we could provide massive taxpayer subsidies for it. And even the people who produce it, they say anytime we try to take away the subsidies, oh, if you do that, we'll all go bankrupt. So this is not an efficient industry. If you want to make an economy poorer, I can't think of any way to make an economy poorer than by forcing people to use energy, which is the master resource. Everything we have is derivative of energy. If you're going to raise the price of energy, you are going to impoverish people. It's, it's, I just think I don't even see the logic of it at a time when we are, have such abundant oil and gas. And, and uh, so we ought to do things that are efficient with government, but certainly not force feed uh, uh, an energy source that, uh, you know, for we've been using for 500 years. I mean, there's a reason I wrote a book, uh, as many of you probably know, called Fueling Freedom. There's a reason we stopped using windmills 300 years ago. What, what caused the Industrial Revolution was we started using efficient forms of energy that could, uh, that could provide the power for an industrial economy. I mean, does, is there anybody out there who really believes we can power a $20 trillion industrial economy with windmills and solar panels? I mean, really? Feel free to comment on any of that if you want, Randy. Only if you want. First, uh, the evidence is all over the country uh, that the New Deal produced useful things. I, I, I would use the job guarantee to produce useful things wherever we can. Um, the unemployment numbers uh, are uh, uh, 
very misleading because they included all the New Deal workers in the unemployment numbers, and that is why the unemployment rate did not go down. Uh, the New Deal employed 13 million people. Um, oil prices, I, I, it's just irrelevant. I mean, uh, we're, we're going to stop using oil uh, or uh, civilization will not survive. It's pretty simple, one or the other. Uh, so we will stop using oil. Um, everyone knows what Churchill said. Uh, Americans will do, uh, uh, will finally do the right thing after they tried everything else. And that is the right thing to do and we will do it. And I think the markets are starting to see that. And uh, that also helps to push down the price of oil because why would you invest in oil when it is a dead end? Thank you. Um, I think I'll fit in maybe two questions more. Um, there's a question about inflation, um, uh, inflationary def uh, and really deflation. Uh, beyond the short-term demand for dollars that was brought up here, what mechanisms could extend a deflationary scenario over the medium term, like two, five years? And what policy responses would be needed to support the economy out of it? Who wants to start with that one? Well, uh, yeah. A collapse of demand uh, could do it. That uh, in conjunction, uh, if commodities prices really did continue to fall, of course, that also helps to push down prices. Um, what do we need to do? Um, uh, it's very tough. Uh, normally, if you have deflation and pressure, the answer is to raise aggregate demand. But until people can go to work and we can produce stuff, that by itself is not uh, really a very good answer. Um, so, I mean, we could sort of, uh, by having people bidding against each other, drive the price up, but that doesn't really help us at all. So we, we might be able to reduce the deflationary pressures, but it's not really help satisfying our real needs. So that's a, it's a good question. I mean, look, this is, we really are swimming in some uncharted waters here that we've never seen anything like this before. So these are not easy questions to answer. I mean, who would have ever thought we'd have the federal government, you know, borrow three, four trillion dollars, five, six trillion, and that people would keep <laughs> buying our bonds. So it's something bizarre is going on out there. Uh, I, <laughs> I believe that um, the, um, that uh, Milton Friedman said it best that, you know, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And that's the case of deflation. So if you have, you know, it goes back to economics 100 that uh, inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. And uh, that means deflation is too, many, too few dollars chasing, uh, you know, a certain amount of goods. So we need, we need to put more money into the economy and uh, we, what I, or what I call dollar liquidity because everywhere, everyone around the world wants to own dollars. I mean, there's really only one currency in the world right now and it's the dollar. And so, uh, although you are gonna, I mean, one interesting kind of thing for folks to think about, I'm, I'm an investor in a cryptocurrency uh, that uh, just starting and you're starting to see these sprout up all over the place. And it's, it'll be interesting to see whether given the perky jerky nature of currencies and, and the unreliability of them, whether you see these cryptocurrencies replace government um, fiat money. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it'll be interesting to watch over the next uh, five and 10 years. Yeah, it seems in this situation that crypto has been going up and down and everybody's vindicated. <laughs> Depends on which day, you know, everybody's convinced about their position about whether crypto is going to take over the world or disappear forever. Um, I'll, I'll cram in a couple of more questions. Um, one, here's just one to reflect the kind of audience that you're speaking in front of here. If the Fed's actions were to cause inflation, where would we expect this to show up first? In commodities, asset prices, or wages? Commodities. Feel free to pass, uh, but throw out your thoughts here. It always shows up in commodities first. And that's, you know, you look at what happened in the 70s uh, when um, you saw the big, every, everyone remembers the big spike in, in, in inflation that we had. <clears throat> when inflation rates hit, you know, 14%. Uh, and that was uh, reflected in commodity prices. I remember the price of oil went from, 
you know, ten dollars a barrel to thirty dollars a barrel, in in you know, actually it was probably started at about eight dollars a barrel, went to thirty. And remember, that was a time when everybody, all the doomsdayers, you know, I love these doomsday scenarios, like the world's come to come to an end. I mean, people probably remember the overpopulation crisis, and that we're running out of oil, running out of gas, we're running out of food, we're all going to starve to death. I mean, these doomsday scenarios never come true, and that's because we, as a society adjust through technology and innovation and ingenuity. And that's gonna be, if, if climate change is a crisis, it will not be dealt with. Does anybody really think the government is gonna solve a problem of a changing global temperature? It's gonna, it's gonna be, come from private innovation and that's what always uh, leads to improvements in living standards. And look, I've, I, I'm always a, an optimist. So I do think we're gonna be able to get out of this. I think it's going to take a while. I think uh, we're going to start to see things get better by the end of the summer. And hopefully in the fall, we'll start to maybe, I do agree, it's going to look like an L-shaped recovery for a while. But then I think once we start getting this behind us, uh, I think you know we could be in a good shape. The one thing that does worry me, and I agree with this, is if you have a second recurrence of the disease, that's bad. But hopefully, the one thing to remember, first of all, we got treatments coming. So treatments will change everything because if you get the corona and you have a treatment, then then people aren't going to be deathly afraid of it. And within six to nine months, we're going to have a, a, a vaccine for this. And so we will put coronavirus to, uh, you know, to bed just like we did uh, you know, polio and uh, smallpox and all of these other diseases of the past. Monetary policy cannot get money into the economy. It can get reserves into the banking system. That's what we did with QE. Uh, we ended up getting trillions of dollars, quadrillions of yen, trillions of uh, UK pounds and trillions of euros into the banking systems so that banks had massive excess reserves. That money never gets out of the banks. Uh, there's no way that reserves can get out of the banks into the economy in order to spend and uh, reverse deflation or cause inflation, whatever you're trying to do. So it's fiscal policy that could do it. Um, the, uh, the, that's not saying the central bank shouldn't do something. I'm just saying that uh, there isn't a direct link from that to prices. However, uh, it uh, can affect asset prices. Um, so banks that have massive amounts of um, reserves uh, sort of seem to have gotten used to that and uh, they look to alternatives to normal bank lending business and um, get involved in exotic things with very high leverage ratios and then they they, they, they learn to rely on having lots and lots of liquid assets on their balance sheets, government bonds and reserves. Uh, and then uh, we get strange things like um, the repo madness uh, that uh, infects the system. Uh, so it can help push up asset prices because of the behavior of the financial system when it has lots of excess reserves. I'll, I'll take the prerogative to just ask the last question. Um, there are a lot of policies that I don't agree with that's coming out of the administration, but I can still see the rationale on some level. Like I can see why they can might be doing this. One thing that I cannot wrap my head around is the immigration policy. Uh, we have we have a need for our uh, guest workers, and the H two B program that lets people in was canceled. We now have the president uh, canceling the uh, green card applications at least putting them on hold. Uh, I cannot see how this is saving the United States at this point. I'm really curious about what you, you to, uh, whether you agree with these policies and how to understand them if you do. Well, I'll start and then I have to, have to run because I have another call. It's been fun. By the way, I've learned a lot from this. So thank you. It's been fun. This is the last one. So you're good. Yeah. And so, um, uh, I, look, you're not going to find anybody who's more pro-legal immigration than I am. Immigrants are a great, great asset to our country and they've helped build this country and they are the innovators. They have a great propensity to start businesses and I love businesses. Uh, so, and they're the hardest working people. And in fact, I've been thinking, you know, as I go, because you know, I still go to the 
supermarket and <clears throat> some of the shops that are still open, most of them are closed, or just the services that you still get. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I just, I, I've been astounded by the fact that the people are actually up and running and working right now are immigrants. <laughs> you know, I wonder if people still see the same thing in, their, in your towns and in, in the Chicago area where, uh, you know, it's Eastern Europeans and it's Asians and, and Mexicans that are, that are doing the work for us as the rest of Americans stay home. So, yes, we need immigration. Uh, I, uh, I think it has to be legal, obviously. And with respect to the shutdown of legal immigration, uh, I, I would say that um, one of the, obviously the smartest thing Donald Trump did that is, you know, that saved tens and tens of thousands of lives, which every liberal opposed, was shutting down travel from China. Thank God he did that. Um, and then he, he shut down the travel from Europe and that also saved tens of thousands of, thousands of lives and people called him a xenophobe and a racist for doing it. And uh, it, it was the single most important thing we've done in terms of containing uh, this virus. But I'm in favor of letting more immigrants in, but you have to have some kind of testing before they can come in. And I, I don't actually under, quite understand what the order, whether that's part of the order. So yes, immigrants should come, but everyone, but when they get at the border or before they get to the border has to be tested to make sure they're not uh, carrying this disease. And thank you very much. It's been a real privilege thank to you. be with you. And, uh, we'll let you go now then. If you you. I don't know if I agree with everything you said, but thank you for explaining modern monetary theory to me. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for it. Thanks for taking your time. All right, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have a shot at this question as well, if you want to. I, yes, I think it, it may make political sense. I don't see that it makes any economic sense. And uh, e even before this, of course, they had slowed down all of the processing of visas and green cards and so on. And so it, it which has nothing to do with keeping out immigrants. I mean, the green card people are all here, the people who have applied, they slowed down all the processes. Um, and it just looks purely political to me to feed the anti-immigrant base uh, that uh, Trump thinks he needs to rely on. So I, I don't think it serves any economic or health purpose. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you for helping us making this both fun and educational. And thanks for everybody who tuned in today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And also thank you to Harbor Capital Advisors for sponsoring this event. And uh, if you have any questions about the event, you can contact the CFA Society Chicago. Best way to do that is on email. It's info at cfachicago.org. So info at cfachicago.org. Thank you all again for joining us and we wish you a pleasant evening.